Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to this um, to this session. A very warm well welcome to this session, which is the last of three pre-launch events of the DSA Conference 2022, entitled um, "Just Sustainable Futures in an Urbanizing and Mobile World." The last two events uh, covered are now available on the DSA website, and I really warmly invite you to listen to them in your own time. The conference itself will be running online from 6th to 8th of July and is being hosted by the Development Studies Association and University College London, UCL. So there's still time to register, so please do join if you're able. Uh, we will show the, the, the slide for registration right at the end of the, of the event. I would like to acknowledge here the support of UCL's grand challenges and global engagement for supporting the pre-conference webinars and also the Bartlett faculty for its funding support to the conference, in particular in ensuring the participation from Global South colleagues. So my name is Barbara Lipietz. I work at the Bartlett's Development Planning Unit at UCL. I'm also Vice Dean International of the Bartlett faculty. I will be chairing this exciting and reflexive panel, exploring the role of the university in bringing about just sustainable futures. Before getting stuck in, I'd like to briefly touch on housekeeping considerations. So this session is recorded and will go onto the DSA conference website shortly after the event. Attendees will not be visible. Also, I'd like to encourage feedback and impressions from, from you, from our audience today. So please feel free to, to use the chat function. And I'd also especially like to encourage questions uh, for our panelists. So could you please use the Q&A function button for this, which is at the bottom of your screen. So why, um, why this panel on the role of the university in bringing about just sustainable futures? Of course, the DSA conference provides a perfect backdrop for this. So it's an academic conference seeking to explore and respond to our contemporary challenging world. So in the world of the conference itself, it's exploring just futures in an urbanizing and mobile world facing a climate and ecological crisis um, also in a pandemic or post-pandemic context. So the multiple crises that are engulfing our global community are multiple, intersecting, and require nuanced place-specific responses that are steeped in an understanding of the long durée of structural processes, an understanding of the stubbornness of entrenched power relations at multiple scales, and the impact also of accelerating global processes such as climate change, biodiversity loss, or the growth of, of the digital revolution. Deep inequalities puncture societies and communities' abilities to engage with, adapt, and change, um, and change, sorry, their given environment for the better. And in this fast changing context, the role of knowledge, of knowledge production and learning are critical, but is also hotly contested. Historically, academia has had a privileged position in this knowledge space, and part of that privilege or that legitimacy has been its perceived publicness, the, pub the perceived publicness of the university. So producing knowledge for the public good, training future practitioners, but also future knowledgeable citizens. But this vision of the university as a public actor or this public role of the universities has come under challenge from without, the university with critiques of an aloofness from the urgent and conflictual reality. So that famous image of the university as an ivory tower. And from within also with many colleagues questioning the impact of market intrusion into the university and what it may mean for the university's ability to play its public role. So how then can we rethink or reactivate the public role of the university so that it can indeed play a role in supporting more just sustainable futures? How does this public role manifest in different contexts? How does it articulate across the three key functions of the university, namely education, research, and public engagement? And as we think about these challenges, what are levers of change? What can support a more engaged, just, and ethical practice of knowledge production and co-learning? Finally, 
I'd like to draw attention to the local global dynamic at the core of, of the questions I've just set out or the core of this reflection. What key questions does international engagement or an international ecosystem, as one of our speakers uh, calls it, raise for thinking about, for activating a public role of the university? These are really big question uh, for our panel. Um, and I don't think we'll be able to address all the, all the array of issues here, but we have four wonderful speakers coming from very diverse uh, context. Um, and as you will see just now, they have a lot uh, to say about these issues. And I, I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation. So we have four speakers and I'm going to present them in turn. Um, the first speaker for now is Neha Sami. Neha is Associate Dean at the School of Environment and Sustainability at the Indian Institute of Human Settlements. Her research focuses on the governance of infrastructure, especially mega infrastructure in the context of post-liberalization urban India, as well as environmental governance, particularly in the subnational scale, where she focuses on institutional analysis and state capacity. She teaches on questions of governance and sustainability and anchors the research program at the IIHS. So her research has been published in a number of journals, Economic and Political Weekly, um, International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Land Use Policy. And she also is a corresponding editor for the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. She's also on the Editorial Collective of Urbanization. I won't go in the detail of her uh, credentials, but there are many, uh, as you will see just now. Neha, uh, looking forward to hearing your contribution. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barbara. Thank you for inviting me to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> it is indeed just a, a privilege to be here. Um, and it's also, I think, um, really wonderful to sort of participate in this as part of a longer conversation that um, we have been having with colleagues at the DPU and elsewhere as well. Um, so uh, as, as Barbara mentioned, I'm located at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore. And what I would like to reflect on uh, today is sort of my experiences and, and sort of drawing on experiences of uh, my colleagues at, at the IHS um, on, um, on, on the role of an institution um, like the Indian Institute for uh, Human Settlements uh, in the larger kind of role of, of uh, learning, knowledge production, and dissemination. Um, and I, in doing so, I want to focus on three uh, key things. One, in our context, is particularly the institutional form um, that, that, that we have chosen as an institution. Uh, so the, the sort of approach that we have um, selected and the approach that we have kind of after much deliberation arrived at around our sort of teaching and learning pedagogy and philosophy. And um, as Barbara mentioned earlier, the, the role that we uh, have played and, and the, the way we see ourselves as part of a larger ecosystem of uh, knowledge production. Um, so the IHS is, is relatively young. Uh, we're just over 10 years old. Uh, and we were set up uh, actually with the explicit um, aim of, of you know, performing a very particular sort of public facing function in the Indian context, which was to create uh, a new generation of urban practitioners. Uh, and so the, the, the kind of the, the, the role of a university as a public space uh, and as, as a performing um, a, a very key kind of uh, role within not just the, the educational ecosystem, but also within policy and practice is something that is kind of built into the DNA of, of the IHS. Uh, and so in, in that way, um, we're a little bit different from, from other universities um, because we're, we're also, uh, and this is where really our institutional form, I think, has stood us in good stead is that we aren't actually a university yet. Uh, we're we're uh, an aspiring university. We 
um, our, our, uh, our national education institution, uh, but we have also been able to, to experiment and, uh, and function in multiple ways and, and perform uh, certain roles within, within the Indian education system because we have been outside of the formal uh, public university system as well. And I think that is something that I want to, to highlight is the role of uh, you know, a, a public university, a private university, or something like IHS that sits between and straddles between between those two. Uh, and and it has been um, because of our kind of fluidness of, of being able to move between being an educational institution, but also being able to practice uh, and intervene in policy, intervene in in place um, in, in, in India very concretely uh, that has emerged from the, the sort of flexibility that our institutional form has given us. And that is something that I would like to put on the table as, as sort of thinking about the institutional form of, of the university uh, and, and the, the shape that it needs to take in order to be flexible, to respond to uh, a whole range of, of, of uh, questions, a whole range of challenges, whether in terms of the kind of knowledge it produces and the kind of knowledge <clears throat> it disseminates, but also the function that it performs in and, and the ability of it to bring people together to create that knowledge. And that to me brings that brings me to my second point, which is sort of the larger approach that the IHS has taken uh, in terms of um, thinking through how uh, we would like to teach and how we would like to create uh, and, and disseminate knowledge. Uh, and the the IHS curriculum was actually co-created over a long two-year process, um, which you know several people on this call, on, on, on this panel, including colleagues at the DPU, were part of, um, and it, it was sort of created it in collaboration with colleagues across the south, across the north, uh, to actually reevaluate and re kind of reconfigure in some ways what an urban pedagogy for um, you know emerging sort of 21st century uh, urban regions needs to be um, and the outcome of it at least in our context and the way we operationalize it and we practice it is that we try very hard to, to redefine what the classroom itself means uh, we've we've tried very hard to expand and, and sort of reconfigure the idea of what a classroom is to actually bring the city and a whole range of other participants uh, who might not be considered as conventional pedagogues, uh, including community stakeholders, activists, um, you know, government officials into the classroom, but also take the, the classroom to them. Uh, and one example of it is, is uh, you know, workshops that we run regularly as part of uh, the recently concluded NO project with colleagues at the DPU on teaching and learning for uh, community uh, stakeholders and activists across India. Um, and the, the and the foundation of what we've tried to do at IHS in terms of our role uh, as a knowledge institution is actually to also be a convener, to provide a space, uh, not just for academics and not just for researchers, but for urbanists in general, uh, and however they define themselves, to come together to be able to share knowledge uh, and to be able to participate in the process of creating knowledge itself. Uh, and in doing so, we try to not privilege particular kinds, particular sort of histories of, of learning. Uh, and we try kind of to bring together a larger group uh, of people, including actually our learners in the classroom. And so our teaching philosophy relies very much on everybody in the classroom, however, you know, the, the classroom is defined, whether it is within the four walls of, uh, of the university or outside in the city to all collectively learn together. And I think that is something um, that, that universities have the power to do, to bring together uh, and to convene uh, around sort of, and, and be able to sort of open up uh, to different kinds of knowledges to, to, to be able to not privilege a certain set of voices uh, over others. And finally, uh, I think I'd like to sort of uh, close by, by talking about sort of this participation in a larger ecosystem uh, of knowledge creation, production and dissemination. Uh, and I, I think coming from an institution that is embedded in the South, uh, coming from an institution that, that actually within the Indian context where there isn't a very robust uh, research ecosystem, for example, or there isn't a very robust uh, funding ecosystem, it has been a privilege uh, for us at IHS to be able to participate uh, in, um, you know, sort of international um, ecosystems of, of learning, of, of funding, uh, and that has allowed us and given us the freedom and flexibility to be able to convene locally. It has allowed us the ability to, to convene across, uh, not just in India, but across 
different locations of the global south. Um, and that to me has been an incredible privilege. Uh, and I think that is something else that that I feel universities um, and, and in our context particularly has both been uh, and has given us the freedom to act and design kind of you know processes and structures that enable us to collaborate across local, regional, and international boundaries, but has also been a really sort of strong constraint for us. And um, it leaves us as an institution in a very precarious situation because in the absence of uh, you know, being able to participate in, in a larger uh, sort of political economy around knowledge, uh, in the absence of, for example, funding, uh, the, the, the kind of ability of an institution uh, like ours, which is young, which is located in, uh, you know, in, in the South becomes quite challenging and quite, quite tricky. And so I think that the, that going forward, it would, it would be great if we as, as universities, as, as people participating in knowledge ecosystems, were able to find ways of leveraging um, partnerships and, and, and using sort of this international dimension uh, and the, the kind of participating in the larger international ecosystem to actually leverage much more partnerships across the South uh, and, and sort of foster that, that kind of learning um, across institutions so that, that there is kind of a flexibility, a flow of knowledge and, and, and uh, partnerships and communication across these, um, these different forms and, and, and functions, because as an IHS, we've learned a lot from being, being part of these. Uh, and I think that it has, while that has brought a lot uh, to us in terms of what we've been able to do, the constraints have been, uh, been really, really challenging. And, and I think it's, it's, it's worth thinking about how we can kind of collectively as university spaces, as knowledge institutions transcend some of those. I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, uh, Neha, for, for these really great comments to, to kick us, kick the conversation. Um, lots of very interesting insights here on the, on the institutional um, form, as you mentioned, um, and the kind of the way in which, in a way, the fuzziness that, that IHS has has enabled. Uh, you to do very interesting things in this public role. Also very interesting questions regarding urban pedagogy. Um, I'm sure we'll be coming back to that. And also I really appreciate your reflection here on this wider uh, knowledge and learning ecosystem and the international dimensions of that. Uh, you mentioned some of the challenges. I'm sure we'll come back to that uh, and see how we can think about that uh, collectively. So we're going to um, pass now to our second speaker, but can I please encourage you to start sending questions in the Q&A. Um, after we've heard from, from our four speakers, we'll open up to the floor. And no doubt there will be, the, I, I know there is dialogue between all of them, So you, but please start sending your questions already. That's fantastic. So now we are going to be uh, hearing from our colleague Mona Harb. Mona is Professor of Urban Studies and Politics at the American University of Beirut, where she is co-founder and research lead at the Beirut Urban Lab. Her research investigates governance and territoriality in context of contested sovereignty, urban activism, and oppositional politics and spatial practices in fragmented cities. She's the author of Le Hezbollah à Beirut, De la banlieue à la ville, co-author of Leisurely Islam, Negotiating Geography and Morality in Shihai, South Beirut with Laha Dib, co-editor of Local Governments and Public Goods, Assessing Decentralization in the Arab World with Sami Atala, and co-editor of Refugees as City Makers with Mona Fawaz et al. She serves on the editorial board of MELG, um, oh, these are all acronyms, which I'm not going to be giving now, but a number of, of, uh, of journals. So Mona, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a few points on context, because um, I believe um, the public role of the university also varies according to uh, specificities of context. So um, I'm speaking uh, from uh, the context of Lebanon, which I'd like to highlight uh, 
about, um, I mean, I want to highlight three main points about that context I'm speaking from. First, the uh, context of operating in a quite uh, dysfunctional state where uh, there are no public institutions that provide public services, including public education to people. Uh, a context of post-colonialism and fraud geopolitics. Uh, we have a very uh, heavy legacy of political history that uh, is still weighs on uh, public life and public affairs today, and a very fraught geopolitical context that makes wars, conflicts, tensions, violence, and displacement, uh, uh, I would say, a feature of everyday life for, uh, for many, uh, I mean, for all residents and dwellers of uh, the country. Uh, the third point is that despite or maybe because of all these challenges, people in Lebanon are in general quite engaged in processes of political mobilization and social mobilization, uh, not necessarily towards change, but they are quite part of uh, public life, uh, public engagement uh, from wherever they are in various ways. I don't have time to dwell on that, but there is this is a vibrant political society, I would say. Uh, now, moving more towards the, what uh, we're invited to reflect on today, the university. So we do have a public university in Lebanon, but, uh, but like other public institutions, uh, this has been, I mean, the role of the public university has been hijacked by the sectarian political elite that rules the uh, Lebanon, and uh, it's not really an active player when it, it comes to public issues and rights. Uh, we also have a plethora of private universities, um, uh, many of which are actually sort of business ventures that serve uh, the interests of uh, uh, this uh, sectarian elite and their uh, networks. But interestingly, we also have uh, uh, long-standing institutions, uh, educational institutions like the one I come from, which is the American University of Beirut, which play an important role in the public life of the country, specifically uh, the American University of Beirut. Uh, and that's, I would say, the main um, uh, argument I want to make today, that this is a university that stands out as a private nonprofit university in this context I just briefed you on, uh, that claims a public role in advancing uh, just and sustainable futures. And it's interesting to note that the motto of AUB, which was declared in 1866, so even before the birth of the Lebanese state, it was actually, the university was named at the time the Syrian Protestant College because Lebanon was part of Syria. Uh, the motto of AUB is that they may have life and have it more abundantly. So a very clear uh, slogan towards uh, bringing about just futures, I mean, abundant futures, sustainable futures, like we're constantly reminded by the administration. So uh, what I'd like to speak of today is that uh, to, to, I mean, to, to show that this public role of the university uh, is it's translated in, uh, in, I would say, two dimensions. First, there's an institutional context that is brought forth by the university. Uh, and AUB is an interesting case because it has been providing a range, I would say, of regulatory, administrative, and financial modalities that foster very much its public role. And it's doing that across the fields of teaching, research, and service, which are the three main you know, domains uh, that through which acad acad academics and academia operate. And I want to say a few words on the Beirut Urban Lab, which I co-founded with colleagues in 2018 at AUB, as an example of an initi initiative that came to the fore pretty much because and thanks to that context that facilitates the establishment of such um, uh, uh, a place, a site. Um, so AUB as an institution has been investing in its public role quite significantly. And I think there's a moment in 2006 where we see that very prominently with the establishment of at least two initiatives that attest to this role. And these are initiatives that have been established by the administration uh, 
One is the Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service, and the other is the Neighborhood Initiative, which services the neighborhood where AUB operates. And this builds on a public role of the university that existed. AUB also has a, a farm in the Bekaa region, an agricultural region of Lebanon, through which it also operates a lot of outreach uh, services to the vulnerable communities in this region um, and through various training and workshop programs. So I see these three initiatives that are very much funded and supported and regulated by the administration as a very clear signal, uh, not only to the public audience outside of the walls of the university, but also to the faculty and students within AUB, that this is a new university that wants to foster and promote and claim its public role and uh, as a central component of its mission. Uh, in addition to that, if we look, if we take a look at, you know, the teaching, teaching mission uh, and the teaching practice of the university, what the, the university, um, uh, I mean, uh, what the university supports and advocates in its teaching uh, mission, we see that there's a lot of celebration of a classroom that's very porous, very permeable to, to uh, guest lecturers, to policy interventions, to workshops, to studio-like teaching, to engagement with the industry and the private sector and NGOs and civil society organization that, uh, that uh, encourages a classroom that is quite professional in that sense. We see that at the level of research, also the university provides its guidelines in a way to value scholarship of pra practice, its promotion and tenure guidelines, and encourages its faculty to be reflective practitioners, research activists, policy advocates, even politicians. Uh, it facilitated the setup itself of teaching buyouts, paid and unpaid leaves, and it even provides a day a week for faculty members to engage in consulting and other activities, including political organizing, if they want to do that, and to bring that back in the classroom. And at the level of service, uh, UB is very uh, adamant on recognizing service to the profession and uh, to, to uh, celebrating that in their renewal of contracts and their reviews of files of faculty. Uh, now, just before moving on to the Beirut Urban Lab quickly, I just want to say a few things about the fact that it's also important to uh, acknowledge that there's an international dimension to this role uh, and that makes, helps it. Uh, I mean, that help, helps it's making this public role possible, which is the funding sources that the, the university has access to. We're talking about an American university. So it re does receive a lot of funds from American institutions, government institutions in the US, but also elsewhere, international organizations that want to foster its liberal arts mission. And, you know, I'm not being naive about it. There's also a very strong sense of, uh, of um, investment in AUB as a liberal arts uh, university in the context of the geopolitical struggles I mentioned briefly earlier. So just like the French government in, uh, invests in uh, Christian universities, Americans invest in the AUB university, and this is also part of that, uh, these, uh, you know, this um, geopolitical quagmire that uh, Lebanon is part of. So it's important also to highlight that. I still think that this, uh, I mean, faculty members and students are quite aware of this, uh, of this situation. They're not at all uh, naive about it, but I still think that there's a, that this is seen as an opportunity that provides both faculty and students an important uh, possibility to leverage this funding and invest it in their own research, teaching, and service agendas. I think this is largely what we did at the Beirut Urban Lab, which was established in 2018 with colleagues, Huayd al-Hariti, Mona Fawaz, and Ahmad Gharbiye. So the lab is a, is a research space. We produce scholarship on urbanization, and we document ongoing transformation processes in Lebanon. But we also very much, like Neha was saying, we're very conscious that we're part of an ecosystem uh, that is seeking to advance urban and political change. We are part of it. 
uh, at least two people among us are activists and researchers and contribute a lot to political activist campaigns and initiatives, even prior to the establishment of the lab. And this is how we've been working together and we established the lab very much as part of it, this collaborative work. So we are part of this ecosystem of change. We want to empower it by critical inquiry and engage research. We want to organize it in connection to individuals and collective who also aspire to advance just inclusive and livable uh, and viable cities. And we've been pretty much part of this ecosystem, namely through uh, the Beirut Medina team municipal campaign in 2016, but other campaigns and initiatives to protect the public coast of the city, to prevent the construction of a tourist resort on this coast, to advocate for the opening of public gardens and open spaces, to uh, advance uh, perceptions of uh, refugees that are more inclusive and just, to uh, advocate for uh, uh, more inclusive governance processes, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, I think we have identified through the lab uh, probably two years for change that we've been pursuing to strengthen this public role of the university and our, our role as uh, activist uh, researchers. So one would be this production of evidence-based knowledge that informs policy making and through which we uh, we lobby for uh, inclusive and just uh, and sustainable urban policies so we we when we and this is very much in sync with what's happening in Lebanon. So when the Israeli war on Lebanon happened in 2006, we do action research to inform the reconstruction process. When the housing market bubble is at its peak, we document the processes of financialization in the city, and we produce a platform and open access to give more informed knowledge to activists who are fighting against it. When senior refugees started being displaced in Lebanon, we did the research to, that uh, clarifies that roles to city making against the stigmatizing discourse against them. When the pandemic happened, we did research on its governance and highlighted both sectarian and solidarity tensions that were in, at play. When the port blast happened in 2020, we are, I mean, since the port, uh, uh, port blast happened, we have been very in, involved in policy advocacy for uh, integrated and inclusive uh, urban recovery, and we do that with international um, organizations, public institutions, the municipality, uh, fellow colleagues and NGOs and CSOs. And uh, in many ways, what we're trying to do through this production of knowledge is to, to um, uh, create what um, actually Gamsky calls a war of position. So we're trying to, to uh, strengthen an alternative position to the hegemonic position, the mainstream position of the sectarian political system, and try to forge uh, alternative an alternative institution and an alternative intellectual resource that would allow people to see the world uh, in a different way and to imagine a different political, urban, and social reality. So the Beirut Urban Lab in many ways is, uh, I would say, is trying to nurture this war of position. We're very conscious that we need to do that. And maybe our, our role is no more than that, it's only restricted to play that, uh, that role of contributing to the production of non-sectarian institutions and resources that would shape these alternative narratives, imaginaries, and practices. The second layer of change, I think that is interesting to, to mention here, and I'll end with that, is that we have been thinking a lot of how to rebuild the public, and I'm putting it in quotation marks, in a context where we don't have representative, effective, and accountable public institutions that protect this public. So how can we do that? And how can the university play this role, which is even more crucial in this context? And we've been experimenting largely with identifying what we're calling institutional ingredients through which we could support the rebuilding of the capacity of public institutions. For instance, we are now very engaged in a in the platform created by the World Bank, the EU and the UN in the aftermath of the port blast that's called the 3RF, the Recovery, Reform and Deconstruction 
framework. And we have been lobbying with NGOs and syndicates and CSOs to create a planning unit within the municipality of Beirut that would uh, implement an integrated urban strategy for the city. Currently, the municipality is hijacked by sectarian interests. So through this lobbying, we're hoping that we would break that sectarian hegemony in a key institution for the city. I mean, this has been um, in the works for the past two years. It involves a lot of struggle and a lot of uh, pull and, uh, pulling, uh, pushing and pulling. And I can't say that it's going to lead to somewhere positive, but it's a struggle and we are pushing for it with the, our own sets of values I've highlighted. So in some, I think the, the Lebanon case shows an interesting positioning of the university as an institution that embraces and claims its public function as a private university, and that's interesting to note, in addition to a strong engagement of faculty members as activist researchers, which seems to provide, in this case, two sets of conditions that have helped foster to activate a public role for the university. I'll end with that. Thank you. Mona, thank you so much for such a, a, rich, um, a rich description of your work. And I, I think so interesting and intriguing to think in a way, it's almost like an oxymoron, right? A, a, a private university activating such a strong public role. And I think you give us some very useful and interesting ways in which you're defining that public role in terms of this, this notion of, of creating an evidence for, for advocacy work in a way, and then creating that public um, within an ecosystem of change. I think a lot of questions to, to ask here and to unpack. Also very inspiring for many of us is the, the institutional support for this kind of role, which is quite rare and quite unique. And I'm sure many in the audience, um, and we've already started quizzing you <laughs> before that, trying to understand how that came about, because that is often a break actually for, for many people in, in, for many academics in engaging in this public role. So many uh, questions and food for thought now. Um, we're going to, we're going to pass now to Francisco. Uh, Francisco de Assis Comaru is, Francisco is associate professor at the Federal University of ABC in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he leads the Territorial Justice Laboratory, Lab Luta, with a master's in urban engineering, a PhD in public health at University of Sao Paulo, and a postdoc at the Bartles DPU, I have to say, <laughs> and of course, ILO in Geneva. Francisco has academic and professional experience, consultancy to social movements, urban and environmental planning, and management and housing policies. His research, teaching, and public engagement activities focus on urban policies, central metropolitan areas, public health, popular and environmental education, territorial public policies, and decent work. So Francisco, to you. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. And I'm very happy being here. And uh, I would ask to Winnie, please. Uh, yeah, if you could. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you see the, the, the slides? It's OK? OK. Thank you. So uh, we, we could go, go on, please. Uh, we need. Thank you very much. Uh, so as you can see, uh, Brazil, uh, it's, uh, you know, is a very large country. We have uh, thousands of higher education institutions, but the majority of them are uh, private institutions. And we have uh, almost 16% uh, of students in public universities, in public institutions. But at the same time, the public universities are responsible for almost 95% uh, of scientific production in Brazil. So it's very uh, important that you have this uh, in mind. Uh, the Federal University of ABC is not so large as, as at the University of Sao Paulo, for instance, but we have uh, 14 graduate students, uh, almost uh, 4,000 postgraduate students, 800 professors. So we, we could see we are a medium uh, university in Brazil. Uh, we, uh, the universities in Brazil have, uh, are linked with the tripods of teaching, research, and extension. 
and in, in the teaching, we have uh, at the Federal University many public policies for inclusion, inclusion for people with disabilities, indigenous people, uh, self-declared black people, transgender, uh, transgender people, uh, refugees. And so it's, it's a kind of uh, inclusive uh, uh, policy in terms of the, the university. We, we, are, we are strong in terms of research. We've developed uh, many uh, networks and many research uh, also in the, under the internationalization uh, context. And please, and we need to go on uh, if possible. And we, we, we have also an important uh, role in terms of extension. Um, and this is my, my, my main uh, entry point at the university. We, we, we try to develop uh, many uh, programs, uh, project, uh, projects, and, and also events and courses of extensions. Uh, please, Winnie. Okay, thank you very much. We, at, uh, at our lab, uh, Territorial Justice Lab, uh, we are looking uh, to the injustice uh, and the social injustice uh, that they are distributed in the territories and how we can, how we could face, how we could uh, comprehend and act uh, using extension, popular education, community-based participatory research, and action research as, as methods. Please, uh, Queenie, thank you. If it's possible, okay. Uh, I will just, just uh, as examples, I will, I will show uh, two currently initiatives. One of them is Observatory of Evictions. We have been developing this project in the last 10 years uh, in a partnership with uh, uh, USP, uh, School of Architecture of USP, and uh, support of our foundation. And in the last uh, two years and a half, uh, we, we, we took part in the Zero Evictions campaign uh, under the pandemic uh, that could join many social movements. And after, I will, I will talk about the Copolis. Okay, you, you can go on. The Observatory of Evictions uh, in, in Brazil is, is in a context with uh, many, many uh, evictions uh, that, are, uh, 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 that are developed by the, the public and private actors. The university is one of the actors that took part in a very large network, but is, is, is a kind of different actor. Uh, we, we are not linked inside the territory uh, as public university. We have another uh, role. Uh, these are some, uh, some images uh, that we developed under the project, trying to understand in, in terms of uh, urban, uh, urban modeling, trying to modeling what, is, what was happening with the families that were evicted in the inner city. So we can go on. Uh, we, we, tried to, we tried to use some... Uh, uh, some tools, uh, developing some tools with journalists, with architects, engineers, and, and so the context is, is not uh, good, it's not uh, easy. We, we had many, many, many families uh, displaced and treated in the last years in Sao Paulo city, and please one, and, and we have also uh, we have also participated in uh, helping organizing public uh, audiences and public meetings with uh, people with families, and, and we tried also to advocate to create the lobby and advocate with candidates with uh, uh, technicians uh, and people that are inside the governance systems. Okay, uh, thank you very much. You can go. Uh, and the, the campaign, the Despejo the Zero, uh, Zero Evictions campaign is, is another uh, initiative that is very linked with the Observatory of Evictions. We took part as well. Uh, it's under a context, a very violent context in, under the uh, low income people in Brazil, the homeless people, okay, you, you can go on. Uh, it is just to, to, to show you some, some, some pictures and some images uh, these numbers uh, are not uh, are not real. Uh, the, the the reality is, is is worse than this. But we have a, an increase, a, a very important increase of evictions 
also under the pandemic. And people uh, in the social movements uh, think that uh, the, the participation of NGOs, universities, and collectives uh, were very, very important uh, to reinforce these networks. Okay, we can go, we can go on. And we, we could, uh, we could act also in the, in the media and in the, the courts. Uh, we reached uh, some decisions in the uh, Supreme Court in Brazil, which was very important, that could, uh, that could generate some important results for the law income people. Okay, we can go up. Just to show this, uh, some examples, please, Winnie. And here we, we have a picture with, uh, with uh, sorry, if you could, if you could uh, return, uh, Winnie, I don't know if it's possible. In, in the, the last one, the last one, please. This, uh, the picture uh, show uh, one student uh, of us, uh, this, this one, thank you very much, uh, which is uh, Gito. Gito is one of the leaders of uh, homeless uh, movements. And he is a candidate of PhD, he's a student in our university. Uh, he's a black uh, African Brazilian descendant. And he is a very important uh, popular uh, lawyer and also researcher. And he is uh, very much engaged in the, in the public uh, scene in, in Brazil. He, he, he helps very much us inside the university. Uh, trying to uh, to join in these in these uh, realities. So uh, I would like just to to, to tell you, it, this is a very important uh, this very important um, uh, initiative for us to try to to approximate the university to the communities and try to uh, open the university for the uh, public uh, public leaders and so on. Uh, please. Uh, Winnie, if you could go ahead, I would just uh, I would just show another. Uh, you can go, please, Winnie. Thank you very much. You can go ahead with the for, for the next scene. Yeah, uh, I would show just the the other example with which it took part in Gaivota's occupation in the south region of São Paulo city. It's a very different project. It's another example. We helped the community uh, in the diagnosis of uh, the environmental, urban, housing, and social situation. It's in the outskirts of the Sao Paulo city, uh, close to the reservoir uh, buildings. And uh, we tried to help them in terms of uh, land regularization. And so we, we, this project we made in collaboration with uh, Michigan University, the uh, Taubman College. It was very important for us to have this collaboration. And we, uh, we engaged many, many students with the, uh, the studies in the, in the field, trying to understand the reality uh, and also trying to develop uh, tools. And we can go on, please, uh, Winnie. Uh, and also trying to, to develop uh, a, a community planning participatory process. Uh, we, we tried to, to develop, we developed many activities with the, uh, the, the community. And also we, we engaged, the, we are involved in, in the engagement of many other communities in, at the, this very large region, okay? We can go. And so uh, in terms of reflections, uh, we, we uh, th these are not, uh, these are not um, affirmative, but this would be like a, a questions, like a issues. If we, we, we think that uh, uh, they really, the public university uh, should or could act uh, and participate in councils, audiences, committees. In Brazil, the public university normally uh, part took part in this, but not all the universities, not, and, and for private, it is a little bit complicated. Uh, and also developing pilot projects for social community and uh, environment interests, uh, providing technical assistance to low income population, vulnerable groups and communities. This is limited, but we can do as well. Uh, also in a very broad, in a, a more broader role, it contributed to resistance and the defense of science, life, dignity, ecology, human uh, 
uh, rights, for instance, under this context, which is very difficult in Brazil, uh, as a university as a supra local political articulator uh, to get out of the territorial control. Uh, so we we are uh, we are in a different position. We we have uh, militia, we have uh, gangs, we have. Uh, lots of violence in the outskirts of Brazilian cities, and so the university uh, is privileged uh, if you compare with the local uh, actors. And extension experiences also could have an important potential to help universities to improve their courses and, and pedagogical itineraries. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm here, I can debate with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Francisco. Again, a fantastically rich presentation um, and very useful data at the beginning on the, the where knowledge is produced and, and how much is public in terms of public institution versus other knowledge uh, institutions. So that's very interesting to put things in perspective. I see a lot of parallels also with this question of bringing other act, bringing the university into the city and the city into the universities, which both uh, the IHS and, and the experience of Mona in the Urban Lab has have been exploring in different ways. And then thank you very much also for raising all these various roles and again helps us to think about what that public role might be. And I think um, very useful because clearly some of there might be debates as to where you know where what are the limits of of the university's role or public role. So thanks very much for that. We now have our last speaker, Zarina Patel. Zarina is associate professor of human geography at the University of Cape Town. Her research addresses the politics and practices of achieving just and sustainable urban transitions focusing on transdisciplinary approaches to navigate alternate insights and responses to complex urban issues in Southern contexts. Her publications on sustainable urban transitions and urban knowledge include, include joint authorship collaborations with knowledge brokers beyond the academy, which is very important for our discussion, foregrounding the diversity of knowledges that are recognized as authoritative in these debates. She's also, interestingly for this conversation, the principal investigator of the project, the New African Urban University, funded by the Worldwide Universities Network Research Development Fund. By engaging partners with the global North and South, this project aims to set the agenda for a more global and inclusive understanding of the scope of system changes required by universities in Africa to advance SDG 11. Serena is also editor of Environment Planning, uh, and the former editor-in-chief of Urban Forum. She serves on the editorial boards of local environment and urban sustainability. Thank you very much, Serena. Thank you, Barbara. And uh, thank you to the audience for some of your comments already. I'm glad to see that there are some, uh, uh, um, some participants that are from Africa as well in, in the audience. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to share some of my ideas on the role of universities in bringing about just and sustainable futures. I've learned so much at the benefit of being the last speaker is that I've learned so much from the speakers before this. Um, we met last week online, but this has been such a rich and, and engaging conversation. And I really look forward to many more conversations. Uh, there's, there's, there's so many parallels and divergences as well between, between our different contexts. So just to begin with, I mean, I think just to reflect that I've been um, in and out of university spaces for well over 30 years now. Um, and, and, as, but, and but as Barbara described my research on urban transitions in, in African cities, one would imagine that universities are a really good place from which to do this kind of work. However, what I've experienced over the last 30 years in, this, in, in, in engaging these kinds of questions is that actually universities provide both opportunities and, and leveraging points, but also huge constraints to working in ways that are working across disciplines, working beyond the university, and working with partners, very diverse kinds of partners. And it's some of these kinds of uh, uh, experiences that I'm wanting to um, share with you today, uh, based on some of the research that I've been doing. Um, so as uh, in the past five years or so, um, I, I've 
decided to kind of engage this discomfort I feel within universities for the kind of work that I'm trying to do in terms of looking at just and sustainable urban transitions um, to actually using the university as a research site. Like, so what are the kinds of questions we need to ask about making universities more fit for purpose around addressing urban, these kinds of urban issues? Um, and, and Barbara's introduced the project that I, uh, that I, that I lead currently, the new Afri African Urban University. I'm also going to draw in my discussion on another project that I've been involved in called Lira 2030, Leading Integrated Research for Agenda 2030, which was a project that was led by the International Science Council um, with funding from CEDA, and it, it, it engaged early career African scholars um, in urban projects using transdisciplinary methods. So um, drawing on some of their experiences as well in, in some of my reflections. So there are three things that I want to focus on in, in uh, the few minutes that I have. And first is to draw a, a picture around context and the role of African universities specifically in urban change and drawing out what are some of the distinctive features of African urban processes and African, urban, and African universities uh, uh, to bring, bring a different dimension into this discussion. Um, I then want to talk a little bit about the kinds of gaps and questions that we are raising in the new African Urban Universities project. Um, and then lastly, I want to hone in based on the Lira work that I've been involved in um, on the ways in which new forms of urban um, scholarship challenge the form and function of universities whilst providing insights into the kinds of structural changes that are required to, ri to rise to the challenge of universities playing a central role in um, looking at questions of, of just and sustainable futures. So to start with looking at the role of African universities in fostering sustainability and uh, sustainable and just futures. So academics at African universities have had a long history of influencing urban change. Governance and knowledge lacuna together with uncompetitive salary structures in higher education have resulted in academics playing an important role in shaping public policy. However, more recently, there's been an upsurge of focus on the third mission of universities and their role in social engagement, service, public engagement, extension. Um, there's a range of different lexicon to talk about this public role, um, envisioning and shaping of societal benefits. These influences can be traced back to the global level, um, as well as to universities who are rapidly, rapidly adopting the rhetoric and strategic intent of engaging um, in bi-directional bi knowledge co-production with a range of actors to foster societal benefits. At UCT, the University of Cape Town, where I am based, social responsiveness is the core pillar of the strategic vision of the university, which is quite similar to the University of Beirut that Mona spoke about. However, despite these strategic, this strategic intent, support for and recognition of engaged forms of scholarship and teaching are uneven across the university. Given the distinctiveness of urban processes and dynamics in Africa, intervening in urban change must necessarily involve engaging with both theory and with practice. It follows therefore that the three main functions of universities, research, teaching and engagement, must be different on the African continent because of these unique contexts. At UCT, the history of apartheid in South Africa has resulted in a specific focus on social justice, transformation and decolonization. Transformation in interventions are largely focused on shifting the racial representation in employment and admission processes. However, universities have also been the sites of student protest and student-led social movements around, um, which is quite similar to the Brazilian context that Francesco spoke about, um, uh, around questions of decolonization, if you think about the roads must fall movement, um, social and environmental justice issues, including questions around climate change. Despite national and local differences in the histories and trajectories of African universities, they're still, they are still largely shaped by the norms of the global north. So that's this global embeddedness of African universities. The power dynamics underpinning the theory and practice of urban transitions, transdisciplinary processes and curriculum development are still assumed to be universalized in contemporary debates. 
So if we turn our attention to the, the new African Urban University project that, that I'm leading, the overarching proposition here is that harnessing the potential of African cities to shape the global in, environment and development trajectories over the next decade, this really hinges on amplifying and supporting the concept of a reconfigured, a reimagined, or I think in, in a, 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 a Mona's words, a, a war of positions. So what are the, what are, how do we reposition the African university to engage with the visioning and shaping of local and societal benefits? The increased strategic intent to support engaged scholarship in universities has the potential to foster closer alignment between research, curriculum development, and processes of urban change. Universities themselves need to undergo systematic change, not just at the level of rhetoric, if they are to remain relevant in shaping the urban agenda across the continent. So by engaging with the promise and potential of universities supporting just and sustainable urban futures in Africa, the new African Urban University uh, pro a program, a project focuses on setting a research agenda that engages with making universities fit for purpose by focusing on the intersections between urban research, urban knowledge um, and urban competencies. So we identify three gaps in advancing this imperative. The first gap is that of understanding the effectiveness and impact of universities in shaping urban change in African cities. The key overriding question is around how universities are leveraging their role in urban change. So as I've said already, whilst academics have had a long-standing role um, in informing and shaping urban change in African cities, little is documented about how African universities are leveraging their roles in sustainable urban change. Strategic planning interventions in post-colonial and post-apartheid cities have been largely driven by knowledge and expertise from urbanists and planners based at universities who respond as consultants to calls for capacity strengthening across subnational and national governments. Similarly, academics have supported non-government non organizations, um, NGOs, and community outreach structures in devising alternative solutions to municipal service delivery. However, little is known about the spread of interventions being addressed through urban research what gaps might be might exist both sexually and sectorally, sectorally and geographically. Um, networks of African urban researchers have provided evidence that there are a range of strategies and interventions that are being introduced. However, this is being done unevenly at different universities with varying levels of effectiveness. The second gap that we're trying to engage is to understand how time and funding bound transdisciplinary urban projects can have long-term impact, that have, can have a long-term impact and how we can upscale these. And the key question here is what role does knowledge co-production play in urban transformation in varying African contexts? As the significance of urban Africa for global environment and development systems becomes clearer, the number of funding programs to support transdisciplinary and engaged research on and in African cities is increasing. These interventions are a significant opportunity for challenging colonial and imperialist histories of infrastructure domination. While there are a growing number of research projects engaging across and beyond universities and across African cities, the challenge of ensuring long-term impact beyond project cycles is a perennial threat. Given the momentum that is gathering around transdisciplinary research and engagement, our understanding of the range of partnerships and knowledge co-production engagements is actually quite limited. Similarly, identifying opportunities to leverage the role of time and funding bound projects is del uh, in delivering impact and fostering long-term change is also limited. While project timelines are a more obvious and tangible variable, we have a limited understanding of what impact means or could mean in African cities where questions of relevance, justice, and who benefits are highly contested. Identifying points of leverage for university leverage, identifying po um, points of leverage for understanding of what impact means or could mean in African cities. Um, sorry, I've just lost my 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 my, um, my my train of thought because I'm looking at the chat as well. Identifying points of leverage for universities to support upscaling and maximizing impact based on local experimentation is critical for building the credibility of transdisciplinary and engaged research. It's also critical to ascertain the nodes of intersection that can bring together different actors and expand the range of collaborations between university researchers 
policymakers and societal actors in driving sustainable urban development, engaging with the implications for knowledge production of funding models that typically position Global North universities as leads in research projects, partnering with African universities is a further area for critical activism. The third gap that we are investigating is understanding the role of curriculum and pedagogy in developing skills to support urban change. The key question here is what and how do we currently teach about African cities and how does this relate to sustainable cities and, and engagement and transdisciplinary engaged agendas? Developing the skills and competencies of the next generation of scholars and urban influencers is a central imperative of universities. The data and knowledge requirements of the SDGs provide an opening for the kinds of methodological and analytical skills that students require. However, the distinctiveness of theory and practice shaping urban transitions in African cities underscores the need to decolonize the curriculum in ways that, are reflective, that reflect contextual relevance and challenge universalized assumptions. Curriculum and new pedagogic modes are required to change the landscape of practice and research. In addition to the hard skills required to fill urban knowledge and data gaps, skills, for, skills development for social relevance must access different teaching and learning cultures, mindsets and approaches from those within and outside the university. Identifying the range of soft skills needed for effective partnership building is more challenging to identify and integrate into curricula. The UN, edu UN Education for Sustainable Development Initiative recognizes the significance of values and attitudes to enable more just and sustainable society for all. In bringing relevant curricula and pedagogies to support urban transformations, questions that need to be engaged include what is, the need, what is, what is it that students need to know, learn and practice in order to build the new African urban university? How is this delivered and by whom? What does transdisciplinary engagement mean for teaching-led research and for research-led teaching? So lastly, um, uh, reflecting on the LIRA program uh, and, and, and reflections from working with early career scholars across Africa. Um, whilst engaged research is no longer new, it remains novel in sustainability research. It's gaining it is gaining popularity in funding calls. However, there's very little evidence-based reflection on what it takes to do engaged research in a landscape that is constructed to support disciplinary research. Similarly, there's little reflection on the institutional requirements of allowing interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and systems to flourish. In my final minutes, I just want to take a few, um, I just want to reflect a little bit on the LIRA program, uh, which showed that the context within which socially engaged research occurs challenges numerous assumptions about research, including who does research, where research is conducted, how outputs are valued, and how research is supported. So the first deviation from disciplinary research lies in who, con who conducts research. So in engaged research, the academic researcher is not given the pole position. Um, the objective is to ensure, that partners ensure partnerships of equivalence in the research process with all knowledge, value and all knowledge types being valued. Engaging diverse knowledge communities um, ranging from civil society to policy communities, both locally and globally, and the private sector. These communities don't have equal access to power structures, so require different points of entry and forms of engagement. The competencies required to make these reflective adjustments are not currently captured or taught. Similarly, the building of trust, the nurturing of relationships uh, are key to the success of these partnerships. Again, building these competencies and landing them in state curricula is challenging. The second digression from disciplinary research that lie and the way in which universities are traditionally structured lies in the sites of research. And I think Niha spoke about this as well. The laboratory, the laboratory for engaged scholarship has numerous guises and the metaphorical table around which diverse researchers come together has varying shapes and forms. So similarly, engaged teaching flips assumptions about who lectures, where, and on what. Including a range of expertise implies that research and teaching is situated where partners are. Working in this way requires an unlearning of the disciplinary practices 
with their clear separation between subject and object. The roles and responsibilities of partners changes and the academic must have skills in managing teams and expectations. How research emerging from engaged partnership with beyond the university is valued is the third area that requires reconfiguration. Engagements aimed at improving societal benefits is value-based and relational, requiring much care and investment in relationships, which is unaccounted for labor. The significance and relevance of the academic paper for research partners is not always shared, necessitating the production of a range of other knowledge products or boundary objects around which relevance for partners can cohere, including, for example, policy briefs, comics, documentaries, op-eds, designs, among, uh, amongst others. In this context, emphasis on narrow measures based on academic outputs are misplaced. Research for societal benefit benefit requires a much wider range of metrics to assess the relevance and value of partnerships, learnings, and its outcomes and outputs. Similarly, projects need to be appropriately resourced to produce a range of knowledge products, and researchers need to be supported to develop, to develop appropriate skills. And finally, attribution and impact are challenging in areas in scholarship. In, in, in uh, are challenging areas in scholarship that extends beyond the university. Effective partnerships are often based on long-term relationships and salience of issues being focused on. Prior knowledge, personalities, and persuasion of researchers are of significance, but difficult to account for in our present systems. For projects to be effective, they are often also required to meet global, national, local, and programmatic objectives, as well as the needs of knowledge partners and funders. This is a tall order. Given that relevance means very different things to different partners and at different scales, assessing effectiveness is a moving target. So in closing for universities to advance the achievement of just and sustainable futures, we must necessarily work across institutional and disciplinary cultures. And this requires changes at both the strategic level, but at also at the level of systems. These changes won't happen automatically. Transgressing the established system needs to be planned and executed in deliberate ways within universities, but also through advocacy and action to shift the global political economy of knowledge production, which entrenches patterns of imbalance and reinforces some of the constraints faced by universities. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you for such a, a considered and comprehensive uh, input and also for sharing all the insights from from this project on the new African urban university, I think I hope I have the right uh, wording. Um, and thank you also for well, first of all, this network reflection, which I think is really important to the work that we're trying to do together, we need to think together about these issues and we can only uh, bring about change uh, in a more networked, through a more networked approach. Thanks also for all the inputs thinking across education, research and public engagement. It's interesting actually that we all have different words to talk about public engagement across all our different universities. So we have now a lot of fantastic uh, questions and remarks, and I'm going to try and attempt to bring some of them together. My apologies um, for our for the audience if I don't raise your questions, um, and we will find a way of continuing this conversation. Uh, one of the one of the first set of question I saw um, coming from Sam Hickey, and I think can connect with Francesca Cognetti's questions and possibly also. Uh, Olofin Olabode Philip's question has to do with, in a way, the tension between very interesting, innovative, public spirited, uh, uh, almost activist uh, responses and pilots, and how they are managing to be activated, maintained, supported. Uh, in a context of increasingly marketized universities. So there's almost a, a, a series of questions on tips of how to, how to deal with that, how to also potentially scale up some of these very exciting pilots. 
I saw another question, set of questions regarding the public role of the university and what that might mean. And some were asking whether it had to do with the protection of certain, pushing certain ideas that one cannot push in other contexts. Another one from Adriana in the chat, Adriana Allen was around, sorry, I'm now trying to go up, um, the, whether, whether that public role has to do with a critical steward, uh, the university being a critical steward and broker of knowledge production, circulation and application as commons. Um, again, then asking his question, coming back to the first one is how, how does one deal with that in a political economy of higher education, which is not necessarily uh, conducive to this. There's also another way of looking at this, of this uh, public role coming from Sri Lanka, Priyanvada, uh, from Moratua University asking whether social entrepreneurship and building these skills could be seen as, as a way of, of defining that public role. Um, yes, and then questions about uh, levers for doing things differently. And then another question, which is interesting around synergies between institutions, how can universities here in this instance, it was private and public universities, but I'd like to encourage you to think maybe about this networked approach or this, um, this ecology of knowledge production that many of you have raised today. So there's a lot of questions here. My apologies if I haven't um, picked up on all of them now. Can I ask uh, all of you to pick on the questions that you seem most um, more of interest to you? And I know there's a lot, so just pick and choose. We only have a quarter of an hour, unfortunately. Can I ask Neha perhaps to start? Sure, uh, happy to, and, and um, like you said, th thank you all in the audience for, uh, for all of these very, very interesting and sort of thought provoking questions. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure we'll continue the debate later. It's a lot to, to sort of pick up on. Um, I think there, there are a couple of things that, that I think I would, I would like to talk about. One is I think this idea of the university as a broker in some ways uh, of, of being able to do this. And I think that, um, of course, you know, the and, and, and sort of the, the currency of knowledge in some ways and, and how that circulates. Uh, and I think that I'd, I would go back to the idea of this larger ecosystem in some ways where a lot of the, the, the means and modes of knowledge circulation are, um, are predefined and they're, they're kind of, you know, embedded within other larger ways of thinking about it. I'm thinking particularly about um, publishers and, and sort of journals uh, that act as gatekeepers in a lot of ways to the circulation of knowledge. Um, and, um, and, and I think that is actually uh, a, a really kind of, you know, critical thing that I think I feel as universities, we need to work towards kind of opening up that space a little bit more because particularly coming from institutions of the global south, access to knowledge, I think becomes really, um, really challenging. And it becomes a, uh, it's kind of a, a chicken and egg question in some ways where, you know, you want to participate in international, uh, you know, spaces, you want to participate in these networks, you want to have access to funding, for example. And in order to be able to do that, you have to be visible in certain spheres of knowledge. Um, and I think that the ability for, uh, institutions across the world not to be visible in those spaces uh, becomes a challenge in some ways. And I think that there's also a role um, that, that we have and, and as, as researchers and as people who work in knowledge institutions have a responsibility to, to uh, you know, in some ways, the subjects of our research uh, and the subjects of, you know, the, the, the people that we teach with and, and you know, with our with people in our classrooms um, and the ability of of us to not be able to share the knowledge that we have with the people that we've sort of drawn on to create that knowledge, I think becomes um, becomes a bit of a tension. And so I think the idea of the new the university as a broker um, is actually a really interesting one because how much I mean it, it ends up being a matter of choice within the university to some extent about how to what extent people want to engage the, the institution itself wants to engage with these larger kind of practices of knowledge circulation, but. To another, you know, to the other end, if you want to be able to continue to do the work that you want to do, it's really, really difficult to not uh, not participate in some ways. Yeah, 
You're Sorry, I wasn't I wasn't on. Yes, I just wanted to thank you, Neha, for these additional points. There's constantly more coming to the pot. Um, uh, Mona, please, would you like to just respond in the little time we have? Thank you. Yes, I'll try to take uh, uh, one question and um, reflect on it, perhaps the one by Hannah on uh, uh, decolonization. I know it's a big deal in the UK and um, I don't think it's a big deal where I come from, but uh, I think it's uh, interesting to also reflect on that because uh, perhaps also colleagues have that situation because we've been often solicited to act as partners on a number of funding uh, proposals uh, as being situated in the global south because this is becoming more and more of a requirement, I think, to raise points on proposal when one is uh, fund raising for research. And as Niha was just saying, this is quite challenging because on one hand, this you want that because it gives visibility to what you're doing, opportunities to students and researchers you're working with. The university will be quite happy to receive some funds, but at the same time, it's not always on agendas. You are co-defining with the authors of these uh, of these proposals. You're often uh, dealt with as the local uh, partner, uh, providing native knowledge, uh, to people where you speak the language, they don't. And so you become almost as an RA to, to the, the big scholars in the, the first world universities. So it's not as equal as it wants to be. And then, and I think uh, at some point uh, we've, we've, um, we've come to a conclusion that these are not very interesting setups for us where we are uh, uh, much more uh, ask to, uh, I mean, we're putting much more than we're receiving in terms of even intellectual input, uh, in terms of funding, it's not really interesting. And uh, intellectually, we're often geared towards research agendas we haven't defined. And I think this also tells us about how, uh, the, uh, how Western scholarship needs to account more to realities on the ground. I think we've heard a lot about this and I find it very important. I mean, I'm in a classroom where my students don't have access to internet, to electricity, uh, are struggling to pay uh, for the bus, bringing them to the university, even if the university gives them a scholarship. And when students are burdened with such issues, your role in that classroom becomes so specific and I feel it's often very alien to people sitting in, uh, in first world universities and uh, concerned with other priorities. So I feel there's a disconnect somewhere between the global north and global south and sometimes I find it much easier to work with the global south universities where the issues I'm talking about echoes with other issues and the intersections are stronger. I've been a part of the Arab Council for Social Sciences and uh, uh, as, as an institution that's promoting social sciences between the global south, uh, I found that the, these networks were much more productive for scholars engaged in them. And, um, um, and it tells us something about these partnerships. So I think it's a very good question to, to reflect on and to also think how can we uh, reduce this, this disconnect and make these partnerships much more um, uh, uh, agile and adapted to contexts that have very different circumstances. Thank you very much for, for this. And I'm sorry I had missed that question. It's a really important one. Um, of course, thinking about the public role of the university is local, but also global. And within that, we need to engage with these unequal power relations and we need to look at them very seriously. Um, well, there's a lot of work to be done. And it's certainly uh, something that we need to, that we will be continuing in, the, in, in our conversation. Uh, a few last words from Francisco and then Zarina. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the, the questions. The debate is really interesting, it's very broadly as well, so which is not easy, uh, but uh, I, I'm trying to reflect a bit here. Uh, I think that we, we still have an important task, uh, which is to better define our role or our roles in, in, in plural, uh, we, should, we should think. Uh, in, a, in a so complex uh, society uh, with so many uh, crises we are facing. Um, and I, I, I'm struck by how the academics from the same university, my university, for instance, 
uh, have such different views and actions in the in the cotidianos. So uh, each each professor is a kind of a star in a constellation. It's incredible, and so I think it's not easy. At, at the same time, for instance, when we are uh, in, in a community, in many circumstances, we have almost always uh, to explain uh, what is the university, what the role of the university, explain that the university is not uh, the city hall, is not the, the court, is not an NGO, because for, for the communities, many times the university is something so distant, because in, in Brazil, uh, it's a kind of a space, so privileged, historically, space. And, and many times we have to explain for, for, the, for the popular communities, uh, which is uh, the university, which is a public university, uh, or which kind of things we can do here with them, we can build together, and how uh, and what uh, they can expect from us and what they... they doesn't have, they, they don't have to expect from us. And I think this is really challenging. Uh, and, and lately, uh, we have been reflecting to what extent the university itself and, and also its public role is under, under attack and, and at the same time under dispute. So uh, there is a dispute of narrative. It's a dispute of, of, of the roles, a dispute of the uh, uh, the the kind of space in the in the society uh, which the public universities could uh, occupy. So uh, one another thing, the, the last comment I, I would like to to, to do is uh, I was thinking about uh, how how can we build universities that can better uh, be known and legitimized by the society. Uh, in a more uh, general way. So, uh, for instance, uh, the, the society, many times the society don't uh, understand the role of public university. Uh, many times, for instance, in times of strikes, for instance, uh, or cuts in funding by governments, uh, sometimes that it, happening, uh, it is happening at, at this moment in Brazil, uh, these are issues that are very important. How to legitimize university, universities more, make them uh, less uh, elite, and so that the, the population as a whole engages in, in their defense. Uh, and so we, we, we think that engaged in extension work has been seen as one of the ways to build such legitimations. Uh, but the number of academics that are engaged is still small, and the attacks uh, are diverse. I think we should uh, reflect many more, but the time, uh, I think the time is over. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francisco. Zarina, just one minute. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'll take 30 seconds. I spoke quite a long time when I did my presentation. I just want to pick up on this question about shifting the political economy of, of uh, of knowledge production and I think that you know this is this is a role that each and every one of us um, needs to play as academic activists um, in our roles as uh, sitting on editorial boards on sitting on foundations sitting on trusts um, I think that how we shape and, and and how we speak back to funders I think that the, these are really really important roles that we have to play as individual researchers um, to to make sure that we're not complicit in this agenda that may Makes things more difficult, but rather to push back and to raise awareness uh, where we where we can. So I'll leave it at that. But I put the responsibility in all our hands. Thanks very much, Zarina, for this uh, for this reminder. Um, and I'm sorry we have to close this conversation, which has been extremely rich and thought provoking, and clearly uh, um, needs to continue. I'd like to thank very much uh, our wonderful panelists for their, for their very rich and incisive presentations, also for the thought-provoking questions uh, from everyone in the audience. Um, yes, the conversation will continue and it needs to continue, as everybody mentioned, in an individual but also very much collective, networked and global fashion at very many scales 
in the various different uh, areas in which we, we work as academics. Um, so thanks again for that. Just a quick word in the chat um, to let you know that we will be sharing this recording um, on the DSA website. Um, so, and also to invite you to attend the DSA conference, which will be starting in July. Um, and please uh, continue sending your question to myself. I'll put them in the chat um, so that uh, we can continue this conversation. There is a process in play, but it will be fantastic to hear from, from all of you. Thank you so much again. Goodbye. Chat. Thanks, everybody.